go to a school in a big city that is one of the least safe cities in the US. I chose this school for nursing and definitely not for the location. I live in a row house, that's what we call it, off campus with four other girls. Cheaper and nicer than dorms, or so we thought. I guess you get what you pay for. We are all girls and sophomores in college. As you would guess, we go out and drink, come back, do things we don't remember. We had just started our rent in August, three floors plus a basement which was padlocked by the owners. Understandable, we would definitely have parties down there to avoid immediate cleanup. The house was great, amazing location to the school and work. I am a CNA who works odd hours. I had never lived with that many people before, just one roommate so before we definitely knew if one of us had misplaced or changed something. I started to notice my snacks were either half gone or completely gone. I was getting annoyed but a house of that many people it's too much work to go figure out who ate what so I ignored it. Slowly as girls do we started making comments about someone eating our food but passive aggressively you know, college girls. We all just let it go cause who wants a whole house fight? I work until about 11 in the NICU and get home at about 11.30 mostly on weeknights. I started to notice pans left out or snack wrappers around. I thought it was odd because none of my roommates had done that before, but just thought that, oh, they probably drank a bottle of wine then went to bed and forgot about all this. Again, my roommates started making comments. This time, we started to ask because it was getting annoying, all our food being gone and things being left. I knew it was one of them, but who wants to admit they ate someone else's snacks in college? Snacks are a high commodity. We chalked it up to the girl who always smokes and eats her weight in food. She swore it wasn't her. This went on for about two months. It got more obvious someone was clearly taking everyone's food. Definitely the girl that always smokes. I see her eat an entire snack pantry in a night. I wish it was her. One night at work I was about to get off but a situation happened and I didn't end up leaving until about 12.30. I took the bus home. I carry pepper spray, taser, and a pocket knife, so don't worry there. I got home and was about to collapse. I wanted to go to bed ASAP. I walked in the front door and the stairs are directly in front of you. You can also see down the side into the kitchen. I walked in and saw someone in the kitchen but was way too tired to say hi, thinking it could end up into a 30 minute conversation about nothing so I just went upstairs. When I got to the second floor, I noticed all my roommates' doors were closed, which always means they are either in their room for the night or asleep. I got a weird feeling, just something that made it click. They were all asleep, right? I texted our house group chat asking if anyone was in the kitchen. I felt stupid for even asking. Two responded no, and they said the other two had been asleep. I knew it wasn't any of my roommates down there at the moment, so I dialed 911 but didn't press call. I crept into my roommate's room across the hall. Thankfully, or maybe not thankfully, she didn't have her door locked. I whispered, telling her I think someone is in the house. She gave the wildest eyes ever and almost looked like she was going to cry. She didn't suspect anything like I had, but for reference, a very bad area, as in there was a shooting in the house two doors down only weeks earlier by an intruder. She mouthed to make the call. The whole time we were dead silent, we didn't hear really anything at all. I was starting to think I was seeing things after such a long day at work and was regretting that I dialed think I'm going to look like an idiot when they show up and I was just overtired and dreaming. We explained what's going on and they said they will send someone ASAP. And that actually does mean right away since it is a big and dangerous city. The police showed up and I didn't even want to go downstairs, but the operator confirmed it was them, so I did. But the whole time I could swear the operator could hear my heart beating. The police come in and look around. I'm thinking, oh god, I look so dumb. They ask if there are any other floors. We tell them technically the basement, but it's padlocked, so really no. They check the basement, just in case. Well, yeah, they were right. A man had been living in the padlocked basement. The lock was pulled off the hinges and just kind of propped against the wall. We never looked at that though. We rarely went out back. The guy had taken a comforter of one of my roommates out of the hall closet, 
had a mattress from God knows where and his clothes. Well, he was the one moving and eating all of our stuff. He would come out in the middle of the night and do it. He started getting more comfortable. I don't know if he was drugged out and forgot to clean his tracks or if he didn't really care. My roommates and I have pretty consistent schedules during the week, probably letting him think that any time after 12 was a good time to come out. We never slept with our individual doors locked and that's what freaks me out most. He had access to any one of us at any moment and we had no idea. When he was getting arrested, I was the only one to go down and look. I don't know why, I wish I didn't. I took a picture in the process of him being arrested to show my roommates who were too afraid to go down. This is him. I work at a higher ends woman's clothing store in my state's largest mall. We're also seriously understaffed and generally only have one manager and one associate on at all times. This incident happened two weeks after I was promoted to manager. I was in my first night closing the store as manager on duty and I was already a little nervous, even though I had weeks of training. A few hours into my shift, my store manager asked me to hang a banner in the front window promoting a sale. I asked my associate, Allie, to help me because the sign is heavy and hard to put up. It takes about 20 minutes of struggling to get the thing up, but we did it. As I'm cleaning up the supplies I needed for it, I lock eyes with a man outside the store. The man is sitting on the bench in the middle of the corridor my store is in, talking on his phone. No big deal. People are always out there. He's probably waiting for someone. Our store is between a popular bra store and a well-known coffee chain, easy landmarks for people unfamiliar with our mall. I give him a quick smile and continued on my way. An hour later, Allie comes up to me and tells me the same man was still sitting on the bench outside on his phone. That raises a bit of a red flag to me. The manager on duty is always supposed to be near the front of the store, but being so understaffed, managers are often running back and forth from the front to the back where the registers are. I happened to be helping ring someone out when she told me about this. In the last few months, we've had a few people grab piles of clothes off the tables at the front of the store and just run out, so I casually walk to the front to fold some sweaters and keep an eye on this man. That's when things took a turn for the strange. As I was getting close to the door, I hear the man say to his phone, I'm sure I can get one, but I might be able to get two. Okay, one's coming out now, bye. My mind is still thinking this guy is going to grab and run, once I have my back turned. Instead, he jumps up, walks just outside the doors, and gives me the biggest, sweetest smile. Excuse me, miss. Come here for a second. I want to show you something. Come out here with me just for a minute. Now I'm getting super creepy vibes from this guy. Um, I'm sorry, sir. I'm the manager on duty and can't leave the store at all. And I back up a few feet. Oh, shoot. I just wanted to show you how wonderful your sign looks. I saw you ladies struggling to put it up earlier. I wanted to offer my help, but I knew it was probably against the rules. Now, I understand being friendly, but this guy was being overly friendly, as if trying to charm me. Oh, huh, thank you. Uh, those signs are heavy and can be a pain to put up. Oh, I bet. And he walks into the store. I give him a weak smile and back up towards the middle of the store to straighten things up, while also keeping an eye on him. I look for my coworker and she's now disappeared into the back room. So much for power and numbers. He starts wandering around looking at different items, checking the tags, clearly pretending to be browsing. As he gets towards the back of the store, my store manager, a gruff woman, much bigger than my 5 foot 420 pound self, comes out of the back room. She starts talking about schedules and meetings, so she's clearly the one in charge of the whole store. He sees her and makes his way towards the exit. I'm still at the front, but have wedged myself between a table and two mannequins. You're doing a great job here. You lovely ladies have a wonderful evening. Tips his hat and leaves. My store manager is on her way to the doors when I jump in front of her and explain everything. I've seen just about every side of her, but I've never seen her look as concerned and startled as she looked when I told her. 
but being the no-nonsense type of person she is, she tells me she'll go ask him why he's trying to get her employees out of the store. She walks out the door, looks towards the direction he walked away, and comes back to tell me he's now standing in a spot I wouldn't be able to see unless I walked out of the store. Unfortunately, she could not stay with us because she had an appointment, but told us to call security if we saw him again. As luck would have it, 30 seconds later, two guards are about to pass my store. I flag them down and explain everything. They're clearly concerned too, especially since there's been reports of people trying to lure women out of the mall. They start walking towards the direction he was in to have a chat with him. Five minutes later, one guard comes back and asks me if the man sitting further down the corridor is the same man. It was. He wasn't too close, but still close enough to come back when he had the chance. At this point, I'm about to have a panic attack and almost start crying. The guard says he'll stay a close distance from the store for the rest of the night. Luckily, the man didn't come back. I think security made him leave, but I'm not totally sure. I called my husband and had him walk Allie and me to our cars. As I recounted the story to my husband, I realized something. The man was wearing a zip-up sweatshirt with large pockets, which he had his hands in the whole time this transpired. I firmly believe if I walked out of the store, he would have pulled a concealed weapon or something to get me to leave the mall quietly. Deep down, I know if I was stupid enough to walk out, I never would have walked back in again. I'm a black girl, about 5'5", five five, standard athletic build. I was a soccer and volleyball player, and I'm often told I'm very pretty. I say more decent than pretty. Also, I've got anxiety that makes me freeze up in uncomfortable situations, so that's been amazing. When I was 19, I worked at a craft store. The majority of our guests were either young kids working on a school project or elderly women looking for sewing supplies. When I first started, I worked 4 a.m. to 12 p.m. stocking shelves. I'd been there about two days at this point. That morning, I was stocking sewing notions. Yes, I know, riveting. I overheard a very boisterous man talking to my co-worker a few aisles away. He said her name almost every other word. Okay, Samantha. Well, Samantha, tell me, Samantha. That kind of deal. I assumed this guy was a regular or something that knew everyone by name. I kept stalking the shelves. I heard him say his goodbyes as his voice got closer. I saw a man about five foot eight, round bellied and white with shoulder length white hair, probably in his fifties to sixties. He glanced down the aisle and kept walking. I saw him walk back and forth past the aisle a couple of times thinking he was looking for something. As I was stalking, I found a broken set of buttons. Whenever something is broken, we had to take it to the register to put it in a specific bin. As I made it up front, I realized he was at the register I had to go behind for the bin. As he was checking out, he turns to me and goes, Excuse me, are you a model or do you work here? I smile and say, I just work here. The cashier at the time gave him the sassiest eye roll. I began to walk away and he asks, does your husband tell you how beautiful you are every morning before you leave? I kind of rolled my eyes because I'm quite clearly not married seeing as I was 19. Not only that, but because my shift was so early, I never wore makeup so I looked even younger. I said, no sir, I'm not married. This, as usual, was a mistake. Sometimes honesty isn't the best policy. He perked up and said, Really? Do you want to be? He kind of chuckled. I began walking down the aisle, smiled and waved back at him, telling him to have a good day. He then began to shout his phone number down the aisle. I walked a little faster and got back to my spot in the back of the store. That was weird, but it was over. Well, about ten minutes later, I've now moved to zippers in the middle of the store. As I'm stalking, I feel somebody's body heat on my back. It's him. I jump because I'm a coward and ask if he needed something. He said, Of course. You. Insert the biggest sigh of my life. I smile and ask him again if there's something I can help him with. 
He sees my name tag and begins doing the same thing he was doing earlier with my coworker, constantly repeating my name. He wanted conversation, so I talked, but kept my back to him. My shirt was long enough to cover my butt so I wasn't worried about him checking me out or anything, and he was about three feet away at this point. You're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Now I'm all for compliments, but that's a reach. I'm serious, you are. Okay. So what do you like to do? Eat. I mean, I was being honest, I wasn't realizing this was a massive invitation to take me out. Really? What do you like to eat? I tried to think of the most uninteresting things I could say so he would leave me alone on his own without me having to ask him to get out of my face and hurt his pride. Uh, Mexican usually. And what do you like to drink? He moved closer. I could now feel his body heat again and smell his musty, not musky, cologne. I don't drink. His voice drops significantly and he moves closer now about five to six inches away from my ear. Mmm, so you're a good girl, huh? A good, fresh one. I can feel his breath on my ear. He's now standing beside me, practically with his whole front side touching me. I ignore the statement and keep working. At this point, my hands are trembling. It was getting hard for me to even put items on the hook. He continued talking softly in a deepened voice. So why don't you let me take you out? We'd have so much fun. I decline. Oh, please, baby. You would make me such a happy man. You don't even know. I decline. Take my card. Hands me a card. He's a holistic healer, of course. Please call me, baby. You're so beautiful. I can't wait to hear your voice over the phone. I decline. What can I do to make you mine? Please, anything. I can hardly hold myself back. His breathing got harder. I ask him if there's anything store-related I can help him with. He asks me how to install a zipper on clothes, and I explain it as simply and quickly as possible. So, this is the start of you boss me around, huh? Telling me what to do. You like to be in control? I want you to tell me what to do. At this point, my heart actually felt like it was going to explode. His body was on me, and it was gross. My anxiety had never been that high for that long. I could no longer think of any responses, no more customer service, I couldn't say anything. I just stood there silent. After a few more attempts with no response, he says, Don't think I'll forget where you are. I live close. I won't forget. I'm coming back for you. He never did come back, but I was terrified, especially because I walked home alone. I have experienced two failed break-ins in my student life, both on separate apartments and with, as far as I can tell, no relation to each other. But these events actually help me to become more reactive when it comes to protect myself and my relatives. Now before we go into this, you need to know two things. One, I'm a girl in my early 20s and I've just completed my master's degree. Over five years I've lived in three different apartments, then gave up the last year and lived with my boyfriend's family. More because I was fed up by roommates and struggling financially than because of the intrusions. Second thing, my dad left us. My mom, my sister, and I, years ago to live with his crazy girlfriend. She would threaten us by text and remind us she knew the address of our home. Because of that, I'm very aware of my environment at night and wake up very easily. First event took place in my second apartment. I live on the ground floor. It was one large room with three windows. One next to my bed, the other two ten meters at the opposite next to the entrance with a view on the street. On the second floor were two rooms, smaller each occupied by girls I barely knew, Marion and Alma. I did talk to Alma a few times and added her on Facebook, but that was it. Third floor was unoccupied at the time. It had been during a week or two at the beginning of the year, but wasn't any more as the residents living there would organize parties with friends that would then try to break into other floors' rooms. It had been empty ever since. 
At the start of the school year, October 2015, the street was busy. There were student parties all around town, and as a result, fights and alcohol were rampant. Fast forward in 2016, the city is way more calm, but not dead. A familiar noise woke me up in the middle of the night. It sounds like the tone of my bell, but weaker, and it comes from above. I check the time on my phone. It's 3 a.m. Weird. I'm thinking it must have been a mistake, but then it rings again, this time closer. And it keeps ringing, like somebody is keeping his finger on the button. I keep listening, but stay in my bed. It stops, then all the bells in the building ring at the same time, followed by steps on the pavement of the street going away quickly. I stay awake an hour, then go back to sleep. The next morning, I sent a message to my mum. As expected, she is worried and asks me to talk to my boyfriend, who lives closer to the apartment than her. She also wants to know if I'm comfortable calling the police if it happens again. I say yes, but think it was just a dumb joke made by a drunk student and that I would not be bothered again. If only. The second night, I'm awakened by the sound of a bell ringing. By the sound of it, it comes from one of the girls above me. It lasts about 20 seconds sharp. I wake up and sit on my bed. Suddenly, all the buttons are pressed quickly one after the other, resulting in a sound wave all over the building. I decide to check what's going on closer, but still on a distance. I go to the door of my apartment, which is made of wood and opaque glass, while the main door is made of hard acrylic and double glass. I take a look, and sure enough, nobody is there anymore. I stand there ten minutes waiting, then I give up and go back to bed. Nothing else happened that night. When I woke up in the morning, I saw a paper on the ground next to my door. It says something like, Hey, Mary and me are worried about the ringing at night. I'll send a mail to the landlord. Tell me on Facebook if you notice something else. Alma. It is now Thursday, the 12th of April 2016, and usually this is the day when my boyfriend comes to spend time together with me. Only, this week he was not feeling well, and I was worried he would not be able to come. But he said he would anyway, and that's what he did. Unfortunately, he began to show signs of fever and thus went to bed early. I read a book until around midnight, then joined him. 4.04 a.m. A loud noise wakes me up. I emerge from a very deep dream, and it takes me a few seconds to understand what's going on. I hear my phone on the table. On the screen, I see a messenger notification. I want to grab it, but before I have the time... The sound comes back louder. It is not the bells. It is somebody trying to force the main door. I touch my boyfriend's face to wake him up and feel that he's very hot. I realize he will not be able to help me. I step over him and grab my phone. Almost sent me a message. There's somebody trying to open the door. What do we do? I'm too afraid. All the bells ring as if someone was sliding his finger across them. I still get a panicked text. He rings at the third floor. I rush to my door and see a dark silhouette through the glass. As I reach him, he begins to shake the door very hard. I freeze for a minute. I recompose and shout, Stop! He stops. I can see him hesitate. Suddenly a car comes into the street. He moves to a building to the left, next to my two windows, and now I can only see his shadow on the ground. The car stops and a man gets off the back seat and says in a drunk voice, Thank you, stay safe. Then he closes the door and waves as the car goes the other way. He sees the creepy guy and asks me, Hello, do you need help? I hear him respond in a young but intoxicated voice. No, I wait for friends. The guy from the car tells him, Okay. Good night, and goes away. Almost sends me a new message. Is he gone? But unfortunately the creep is already coming back to the front door to slam the buttons, and worse again, to try to break in. Almost sends me, tell him we'll call the police. I answer to her, I see him, call them, I'll try to stop him. She says that she doesn't remember what the number is, and I give it to her, then shout at the man, hoping it would make him stop shaking the door. I shouted like three or four times without success. I look at my boyfriend, still in the bed, 
but awake and sitting, with the pale face of someone who's about to pass out or vomit. I take my keys, open my door, get close to the main door, and shout at the man, What are you doing? Now, I can see him, and he can see me. He's not tall, maybe about 1.6 meters like me. He has mid-length brown hair and looks as sick as my boyfriend is at the moment. He wears dark pants and a white shirt under a blue and red sweater. Probably a student. He responds to me by shouting incomprehensible gibberish. He heads back to the door, hands first. I take a step forward and tell him to go away with the most angry face I can make. I realize I still have my phone, so I raise my hand and take a picture of him. He doesn't notice as he reaches for his own phone. He freezes for a minute looking at his screen, then, without even looking at me, goes to the left of the street and disappears. The police arrive five minutes later but was not really helpful, nor Alma or Marion came downstairs. I was alone, telling them which way he went, describing what the picture didn't show. The first police officer who talked to me, a woman, was apparently not convinced, even when I told her about the other attempts. She told me to get back in my room, lock the doors, and they would come back after looking around for the guy. They were gone, and while I was sitting at my table waiting for them, I looked at the picture taken around 4.11. The whole intruder thing lasted less than 10 minutes, and the police never came back. The wannabe intruder never came back, and in July 2016, I left that apartment. I never had so many friends coming for sleepovers than during this three months. After a few days, I realized how silly it was to go out in the doorway like this in pajamas at four in the morning. He could have done something. I didn't even feel like I scared him. A few months ago, I was going through my drive and saw that I still had the picture. I don't know why. I don't want to delete it, and... I saw something I never noticed before. He was not wearing shoes, only socks on the cobblestone street. So I don't know why you came, weird guy, but I hope I never see you again. For some context, I went to a high school in a fairly small town. During my high school years, I had a few classes with a girl named Cindy. Cindy was rather awkward and unfortunately was often bullied by many people at school for both her looks and lack of social skills. I tried my best to stand up for her but otherwise rarely had many interactions with her directly. The one class we did have together, however, was journalism, which comes into play later in this story. We had not made any contact for over eight years at this point. I have since moved across the country from my hometown but keep in touch with a few high school friends. The other day, I got a call from a friend and figured she was just calling to wish me a Merry Christmas. However, she had actually received a letter meant for me. We have the same names and lived a few blocks away from each other in our hometown. The letter was hand-typed, single-spaced letter from none other than Cindy. Below is the content of the letter, where names and places have been taken out. I used an app to get the text and did my best to edit it, so... This is what it says. Hi there, this is Cindy from high school. I wish you all and the former journalism team a wonderful holiday and a brand new year to 2019. I have written to a couple of people and will not be heard from anymore after this. I will not be attending the reunion for a lot of different reasons. First and foremost, I moved to blank. I am going to school in January to become a CDL truck driver and then, after a few years, move to blank or blank to work in the oil fields. Depending on how good I make, I am hoping to retire at 40. I have never worked a day in my life and I understand some people like blank and blank who had an issue with my ambition. Even though they spoke badly of me, they also did with a few other people. But my presence happened to anger blank the most. I'm almost 30 years old and I feel like the older I get, I need to stop pretending to be nice. I notice when I pretend to be nice, people take me for being gullible or stupid, only some people detect when I am fake. I know some of you guys in that class, including you and blank, were very sketchy to me. I'm not mad or dislike any of you guys. Heck, I don't even dislike blank. I know some of the things said about me and I was also laughed at for my journalism work. I know it was not fair that I was taking credit for things that I did not deserve because people like blank made it easy for me. 
until I took it for granted. It is like hiring someone unqualified for the job and they make the same amount as someone who has worked there for several years. I spent a lot of my time focusing on having someone be with me and tell me everything is going to be okay. This generation was not going to cut it. If I was in a different generation, the right guy would have been there for me all despite of my troubles back then. Deciding to take on a job working in the oil field someday, I had to finally come to the conclusion that having a family and kids was not going to cut it. I'm willing to have all the willpower to focus on a career path that will give me a good and early retirement. I later realized that people focus on dumb things because they get it from the media. The difference is, celebrities make all kinds of money where they do not have to work as hard and can spend all their wasted income focusing on things that are stupid. Regular people have to have ambition and reach a certain goal and separate their emotions, otherwise you would end up on the streets poor. The point is, I know you guys pretend to be nice to me, but I'm not mad or dislike you guys. I know even Blank was an instigator and Blank was a bit of a snake. The only person I respected the most was Blank. She was honest. She did not like me. She was an assistant in a psychology class I took and handled things well between me and Blank and she did not have to play any games or pretend to be nice to me. I respected that a lot. She was real, and I learned a lot from being like her in some ways. I am upset, though, that because of a French course I took, she believed these lies Blank said about me because Blank also lied to me about things people said that they did not say. I have never said a bad thing about Blank. I wish you all well, but I'm just letting you all know that I'm not an idiot and I know what goes on and I do not think I should be made fun of for ambitions that I had that I was not qualified for at the time. My mom did not meet my needs. She wanted me to take classes or get into programs for her satisfactory reasons. My mom wanted me to take French class when I was better off taking Spanish and get into journalism because she wanted me to be the next Jackie Kennedy. The difference is Jackie Kennedy came from a high-class family and was taught manners at a young age. Recently, I met up with my younger sister and she admitted that our mom did not teach us very much. My sister did better than me because she is younger and had seen my mistakes and she does not have ADHD like I do. But she does get panic attacks once in a while which I only know that if I'm paranoid on the wrong weed that I smoke or if I get a bad trip. I'm tired of people laughing at me and not taking me serious. I'm glad I moved out of blank because people made me feel like I was not enough to society and whenever I ran into people from school, they would get hung up on things that I did when I was 16. People tell me to let go of the past, yet I had to deal with blank who would ask me dumb questions like if I ever had a boyfriend or in a nasty tone ask me if I'm Jewish. Or she would talk about my eyebrows like every person did from school. I'm glad I moved. I'm a lot healthier and things are looking up. So, what is so unsettling to me is how manic and all over the place it is and why I was chosen to be sent this letter. No one else mentioned in the letter was sent one. We did some research and reached out to her sister, and she said she was still living in the town over from us and not where she said she had moved. The return address links back to a UPS store. Maybe I'm overreacting, but Cindy... I hope I never have to hear from you again. So this happened on Christmas Eve just a few days ago. For context, I work for a storage rental company that often has employees that live in off-site apartments. I am one of these employees. On this particular day I was not working just at home getting ready to drive to my mom's, but I'm good friends with the girl who was working. To set the scene a little further, my home job is towards the end of a dead-end frontage road next to a major interstate. There's a major truck stop at the beginning of the road, then further down a sketchy Days Inn motel, then a relatively large boat retailer with an electric fence directly next to our gated property. Our office is on the right-hand side of the property with my apartment directly attached to the office building, but my apartment door is behind the gate while the office door is not. Then further down the road were some businesses that were closed for the holidays, and finally the road ends. So even on a normal non-holiday, 
we don't get a lot of people or traffic coming down the road, and being at the end of the road, we easily can see anyone who's headed our way. So, now that we've got a setting, my coworker and I, I'll call her V, were just talking casually outside my apartment door when some guy comes jogging over from what looked like to be the direction of the closed and electrical fenced boat place. I thought that seemed slightly odd, but having lived in that area for over a year, I've noticed weirder behavior from legitimate people, so I ignored it. V asks him how she can help him and walks to unlock the office door for him, and I go inside my apartment to continue packing to leave. Last thing I noticed is that he was trying the door handle pretty incessantly before she had unlocked it, but even that I kind of brushed off. A few minutes pass and V walks back to my apartment and steps inside to grab her hat that she left and tells me how weird the dude was. Apparently he said he wanted to rent a unit but didn't have his ID or the 25 minimum dollars to rent the unit so he left. V also told me that she could see the same police car now driving up and down the road and how strange it was. I told her the cops drive down the road all the time and to not worry about it. V goes back to the office, maybe after spending two to three minutes in my apartment total. I hear muffled voices through the wall and notice she's calling my cell. I answer and she said, Please come in here right now. I honestly should have been much more concerned than I was, but still thinking she's overreacting, I casually stroll over to the office, open the door, and V is in one corner of the office pointing under the desk. Sure enough, there's the guy from before just crammed up under that desk. From details I gathered after the fact, V left the office door unlocked during the minutes she was in my apartment. Believe me, she will never do this again. The guy was apparently hiding from the cops and had seized the opportunity to hide in our office when he noticed her leave the office. He sees me and starts waving a wallet full of cash around. Tells me all he has on him is cash and he just doesn't want to go to jail for possession. He'll pay us if we let him stay. He seemed pretty out of it to be honest and several dude you have to leaves from me later he walked out without much of a fight. I lock the door behind him and we count the money. Notice that V's car keys had been taken off of her key ring and are on the floor where he had been sitting. We debate calling the police but by this point there are three or four cop cars with lights coming down the road. I go back to packing. V keeps the door locked. At this point, it's time for me to leave, so I'm not late for my holiday plans, but last thing I did was stop and talk to an officer on my way down the road to get the final story and make sure V would be safe by herself. I was told that they caught the guy in the woods behind the property. Apparently, he stole a car, took it to the truck stop for some reason, and thought he could get it to push start while there. He could not. The cops then found him with drugs on him before he took off running. And well, here we are. So glad that he was not violent in any way and left my office peacefully. Things definitely could have gone differently. Also hoping he stays locked up for a while and forgets about the girl who kicked him out of his hiding spot. So this happened back at the beginning of 2018. I was still 15, I don't remember exactly when, but it's in the little town of France where I go to high school. It was a cold day with a bit of rain and wind. Me and some friends, all girls, left school at lunchtime to go to the shop. We wanted something to eat, thus we were wandering in the different shop's aisles. But something felt wrong. Me and the girls with who I stayed, Aurora, felt a strange feeling, like as if though someone was watching us. We noticed a guy who was always in the same aisle with us or the next one. He looked very strange like he was not really there. Empty eyes and a tense but still smiling expression. We didn't say anything. After a few minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to be exact, we joined again with the rest of the girls, finding out they had the same feeling. Two of them, Claw and Lo, said that a strange guy came to talk with them, very weirdly, with a creepy forced smile on his face, the same guy me and Aurora had just noticed earlier. I didn't hear properly his name, but I think it was Mac. We decided to get out after buying some things, already scared, but little did we know, it was just the beginning. 
So now we were outside the shop putting our stuff in our backpack and Mac came out, directly coming towards us. He was literally less than a meter away from me. He tried to make the conversation, asking some questions like, Oh, you're from the high school of the town. Or our favorite subject and thing, considering we didn't know who he was, it was creepy. But the scariest thing wasn't that. It was the fact that a young man came out from out of his car just next to our spot and walked really quickly towards all of us. He then shouted, Bro, let the young ones alone. Stop doing this. And then left the shop very quickly. The way he shouted and how he looked, panicked, scared, was really disturbing. It's like it wasn't the first time he had to intervene like this. It wasn't like he was jokingly saying that to tease his friend. It was clearly a warning for us and for Mac. Me and my friends decided to go. All of that was so wrong. We didn't want to show him that we were scared because God knows how we would have reacted. So we politely said goodbye and then left by walking quickly. We thought it was fine, that it was ending, but in fact it was far from being finished. When we were like 15 meters away, me and another girl heard banging from behind us. We turned around to see this creep putting on a beanie and a scarf just after he ran into some trash can, and now he was looking directly at us. We crossed the road and walked quicker, using different paths to see if he would come after us, and of course, it would have been too easy if he had just left. Mac was behind us every time we looked back. He was clearly following us. Considering it was a cold day with rain and wind, it was practically no one outside, and he was way larger than any of us. Tall, built, but most important, he really looked like he was either on something or mentally ill. More so mentally ill, with his always smiling face and very big, empty eyes. My instinct was screaming to me that something was wrong, that we should run and never look back. So we did. We ran, and after like five minutes, he was no longer behind us, so we started to walk again. Big mistake. When I turned my head, I saw him, staring at me as he was walking behind us. We accelerate, almost running again. Forget the idea of not showing him we were afraid. At some point, he was less than two meters away from me and my friend. I don't know how he did that. If he had run, or if he knew the town well enough to have a secret shortcut or... Something, he was really close to us, so we started to sprint right after a turn. We ended up at the top of a sloping road. We looked back to see if he was still there, and there he was again. But he stayed at the bottom and just stared at us for a solid 15 seconds without moving, and then left quickly. I don't know what he wanted, but I sure know that if even his friend had to warn him to stop doing this, he didn't just want to offer us some tea. Plus, my instincts were really telling me that Mac wasn't someone good. I won't ever be able to forget the dementia in his eyes. This happened five years ago today, marking this experience's fifth anniversary. At the time, I was a shy, conservative, religious, sheltered college kid whose social interactions are very dependent on school-related activities. Today, I'm still pretty shy, conservative, not so religious, currently an NEET, and I barely have social interaction nowadays, but I digress. Being the religious person that I was then, I had requested that my family and I attend Mass on the last Sunday of the year. Sunday came and Mom was the only one willing to accompany me. We attended the last mass of the day, which was six or seven in the evening, because it was too hot in the afternoon and, and I could not be bothered to wake up early for the morning mass. When we arrived, the mass has already started, all the pews were occupied, so we stood by the very back of the church. The mass itself was pretty average, except for a lady in the back of the church who fainted in the middle of the priest's homily. I didn't feel anything was wrong during the whole mass. Usually after the Mass, when the priest would be standing before the altar, people would regularly approach him to receive his blessing. I had planned to do that, meaning I had to cross the whole length of the church to get to the priest. As I walked on the aisle, I suddenly felt like I was being followed. 
In the years after this incident, I have felt what being followed by friends trying to catch up on me feels like, and that did not match what I felt when I was walking down the aisle. I was hoping that my instincts were wrong, but was quickly disproved when a man came up to my left side. He was taller than I was. I'm 5'2", and he was around 5'7". I couldn't pinpoint his age, but I can guess he was older than I was then, maybe early 20s. I didn't know who this person was, and... I didn't know what he wanted from me. He then started to ask me personal questions like my name, my age, and where I live. I knew that I was lacking in social skills, but I know following a person around a church at night and flooding them with personal questions isn't a great way to make friends. At this point, I was uncomfortable. I was still far from the priest, but too polite to just simply ignore him. I replied to his questions, but all were false or vague information i.e. I gave a fake name, a different age, etc. When I did approach the priest, I tried to get his attention to maybe get the guy to leave me alone, but the priest looked like he didn't even care whose forehead his knuckles are touching at that time. Feeling betrayed, I turned to look at other people nearby, but everyone else had their attention on their own business. Couldn't really blame them for that. My last resort was, of course, my mother. I turned around and sped walked my way to the back of the church, but as I neared the spot my mom and I stayed earlier, she wasn't there anymore. I panicked and started to frantically look around. The guy was still following me, now asking me where I went to school. I didn't want to talk to him anymore, and I didn't want him near me anymore. In my panic, searching for my mother, I caught a glimpse of her form sitting at one of the pews at the back. I darted straight for her and squeezed my words out with no pause that I was being followed and we needed to book it out of the church. Mom, understandably surprised, looked at me, then at the guy who was still by my side, then back at me. She then stood up, took my hand, and walked out of the church with me. By the time we got to the car, my heart was racing and I was shaking a little. Being the nice person that I was, I tried to rationalize that maybe the guy really had good intentions and mom would tell me the guy was probably just awkward or socially inept. But everyone else who I shared this story with thought otherwise. For a time, I wouldn't go near that area without my brother, and pretty much lost my dedication to my faith over time because of this experience. My sister and I traveled to Florida just about every summer, if not every other. Since our mom passed away, we made it our mission to try and travel as much as possible, even if it's to places that we've been to countless times. Florida and South Carolina are among our favorites to revisit, as we love the atmosphere, warmth, and not to mention the activities there are much cheaper in comparison to traveling along the west coast. We always make sure that we both have charged phones, should one of them not work or we get separated, and we're very alert when we're outside in an unfamiliar environment that's either not very populated or if it's dark outside. My sister is much more on edge than I am when it comes to this, and I always make eye contact and smile at strangers, whereas she'll avoid looking at people should it be dark outside, a sketchy environment, etc. I usually haven't gotten in trouble because of this before, but nevertheless it's definitely something that I get nagged at more after this incident. This happened in the summer of 2016, possibly 2015. My memory is a bit hazy when it comes to remembering dates. We had just finished traveling around the Orlando area and we had went out to eat. Our Uber driver, since we live in the Midwest, we flew out to Florida, resulting in us Ubering most of the time, dropped us off a bit farther from our hotel and on a different end than we were used to entering from. Typically, they would pull around to the front of the hotel in this U-shaped drive-around area, typically where cars would be left for valet or if you just had to run inside and grab something. However, this time we were dropped off in part of the back lot that was on the opposite end of the hotel than where our room was located. My sister and I didn't think much of it. We were just a little turned around initially. We began to try and find our way around through the odd-shaped building, but with it being dark out, it was hard to find the door that led to our room. We finally stumbled over to the pool area, which was near a hotel room, and began to feel relieved. My sister was beginning to get slightly nervous and anxious with walking outside this late at night, and with our hotel not being the nicest one in the area, 
so we slightly sped up our pace to get into the comfort of our hotel room. Just as we thought we were okay, we were going to be able to call it a night, a young man in his early to mid-twenties stumbled over near us shouting, Hey! Hey you guys! As I mentioned earlier, I had, and still do, have the bad habit of making eye contact with strangers. I turned around and looked at the guy and my sister whipped her head around, giving me a kind of look that yelled, What are you doing? The guy came closer to us and we could tell something was off, but he began rambling away and we were a bit shocked. He kept asking if we were with the group, and when we asked him what group he was talking about, he goes, The business group that's here, the one throwing the big party. We looked at each other, slightly confused, and told him we didn't know what he meant and we began to walk away. He looked at my sister and said a few more things like, You're pretty. You two should come party with us. We thanked him and declined politely, saying we had to go. This is where things got weird. He begins to follow us back and begins talking to my sister. He started to call at her and say things like, Hey, come here. Come back here. She turned around, thinking maybe he had something important to say. I'm not entirely sure why she turned around. This is the only somewhat logical reason that I can come up with. When she turned around, he kept walking towards her slowly and kept saying, Come here. Getting quieter each time. He began to get really close to her and looked as if though he was going to try and kiss her or something of the sorts. At this point, I had my phone out and was recording, keeping it at my side in case something happened. I held it up to my ear, acting like I was getting a call and I started talking on it. Oh, hey, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be right there. I remember saying it on my phone. The guy had looked at me at this point and took a step back from my sister. I grabbed her by the arm and began to walk back to our hotel room really quick and I said something along the lines of how there was an emergency and we had to go help her husband out. The guy stood there and just kept yelling, Come back! We ignored him and went into our room and locked it. Probably not the brightest idea looking back as the doors to the hotel rooms faced outward and he now knew where we were staying. I remember hearing him on the phone or talking to somebody ten minutes later and I looked at the peephole. I couldn't see much as it was pretty late at night, but I could hear his voice and make out a tall silhouette near the palm trees outside the door. I called the hotel lobby and let them know at this point, and we just called my sister's husband and let him know what was happening. After about ten minutes or so, he must have left and nothing eventful happened afterwards. We're still not sure if he was on something or just generally a weird dude. We also don't know if he was trying to kiss my sister, which seems pretty accurate given the tone of his voice he used and his body language, but either way his actions were unwarranted and definitely unwanted. I don't have the phone that I recorded the video on, but it might be on my old laptop back home. If this is the case, I'll try and upload it here somehow so you guys can all see what I meant by his tone and see the proof of this situation as well. Be careful out there. I've seen a few stories on here where somebody accidentally took the role of a creeper and I thought I'd share mine. I don't think I traumatized anyone, but I did give them a fright. Some information, I'm a small female, mid-twenties, softly spoken, but I wear a large black hat, hide my hair and dress like a tomboy, so I'm sometimes mistaken for a guy before I speak. It's probably even easier to mistake me for a man if the light isn't very good, which will probably become relevant later. I used to live deep in the countryside in the proper middle of nowhere. I hated it. There were perhaps four houses in a two mile radius, all separated by acres of fields and trees. The nearest village was a mile away and my house was a half mile away from the nearest main road. I couldn't drive so I walked everywhere. I would go to town to work via bus, came back late in the evening and hop off the bus on that main road and commence the half mile walk to get to my house. The walk involved going via a winding and abandoned country road that was surrounded by bushes, fields, and the odd sheep. There were no street lights, no houses, no signs, and whenever I walked home from work during winter times, it was pitch black. I'm talking horrifying complete absence of light darkness where you couldn't see your own hand in front of you pitch black. If the moon was full, 
it would be slightly possible to see the road in front of you, but if it was any less than full, there was no hope. During the day, it was so beautiful. During the night, I couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Not once in my stay there did I ever meet another person going the same route as me. I felt safe because there was never any people around, but I also felt unsafe because there were never any people around. Since it was absolute pitch darkness, to get down that road a torch was definitely necessary. I had a trusty wind-up one that needed 5-10 to ten minutes of winding to charge it. I always charged it on my bus ride home. I don't think it was a very good torch because after a few months it started getting dimmer. As I said before, I hated all of this. I absolutely hated my half-mile walk home in the dark with only a torch to guide my way. I was always convinced that some ghost or slender man was going to jump out of the bushes at me any second. One day during the winter months after the sun had gone down and I came home from work, a girl got off at my stop. Weird. I guess she must have been heading to one of those other middle-of-nowhere houses. She was also small, a blonde, perhaps late teens or early twenties. I didn't know her. I hopped off after her and saw that she was also headed for the horrible road, a torch in hand. I took out my torch and followed suit, walking about twenty meters behind the girl. All I could see of her was the outline of her light on the ground as she made her way along. About halfway along the road, my piece of crap torch started getting dimmer and dimmer. I wound the dial on it, and it made the weird screech sound that it always made when I spun the handle, but it kept getting dimmer and dimmer until eventually I was as low as a candle. Then it went out. Not wanting to be left in the dark, I sped up my walking pace so I could hopefully share the girl's light and see where I was going. But when I sped up, so did she. I sped up a little more, and again so did she. Then she started jogging, I started jogging too. I thought to myself, hey dude, come on, I just want to share your light, stop being so mean. No, I'm not the sharpest tool in the box. At the time, I did not see how this would have looked from her perspective, for all she knew... A man got off the bus after she did, followed her down an abandoned road, turned off his torch, and then started bearing down on her. But me, being quite dumb, just thought she was being selfish. All I wanted was to be able to see where I was going. Eventually she jogged so fast I gave up trying to get near her. I let her speed away and instead, I just stumbled my way home by holding my arms out in front of me. Only a few hours later when I was lying in bed, did the pieces in my head suddenly click and I went, Ah, I was the creeper. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio down below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.